all the other participants. I think we will start out by uh, having Ms. Sandberg uh, start with her master plan update and go from there. Jim, Jim, yes. I'd like to say something before we start. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So I know we're going to hear an update about the master plan, but there are, um, first of all, I want to thank Kathy Shaw for proposing this study session with the directors of the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority and Erie events so that we could all be at the same table, even if we aren't all in the same room. And I want to thank Brenda Sandberg and Casey Wells for being here. Um, I'm sure the council members each have goals for this meeting, but I'd like to state mine. First, I think it's vital that we start to create a mechanism for ongoing regular communication between these two independent authorities, council and the public. Uh, my immediate mm -hmm. concern at this forum serves as a way to update the public on plans for the West Front Street Access Road, the impact of that construction on existing businesses, including Harborview Golf, Mini Golf, and the natural landscape, uh, including some old trees that are growing there. Um, and I've also been asked if both Brenda and Casey can give brief intros about their authorities uh, before we go into their um, master or long range plans. Uh, I think we sometimes forget that not everybody is familiar with um, the very existence of independent authorities, how they were created, how members are appointed, when and where you meet, and how citizens can access these meetings virtually in the time of COVID. Um, Brenda, at my request, sent me a link yesterday, a Zoom link to yesterday's Port Authority meeting, yet I could not find anything on the Port Authority website so that other citizens know how to, to attend those meetings virtually. And I think we can all agree that with 124 new cases today, that um, public bodies, whether they're independent authorities or um, city councils, um, need to do everything possible to um, make sure that people can keep up with what's going on with public bodies. Um, so it doesn't have to be a long thing, but maybe uh, the elevator speech about um, the authority. Again, I'm doing this at the request of a couple of people who asked me. I'm familiar with the Port Authority and with Erie events um, from my longtime work at the newspaper and with holding editorial boards. So uh, just if, if both directors could um, you know, preface their remarks with that information, I think it would be really helpful to uh, set the set the scene for how we improve communication for everybody. Thanks very much. Ms. Sandberg. Okay, thank you very much. And Liz, I'm more than happy to. So um, I have had the privilege of meeting all of you prior, but uh, my name is Brenda Sandberg and I'm the executive director of the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority. With me today is also PennDOT Deputy Secretary, Jennifer Granger, uh, who you have all met and worked with in the past as well. So the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority uh, was created actually out of the Port Commission, which was a city commission back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in the early 1970s, the state created the Third Class City Port Authority Act, uh, which created the independent municipal authority we know today as the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority. Right. The authority um, has 11 board members, nine of which are seated by the mayor. One is seated by the Secretary of Transportation and one is a governor's appointment. Uh, the authority oversees, and we'll get into this a little bit in my presentation as well, um, but just the quick speech, we oversee um, and own roughly 475 acres on Erie's waterfront um, that stretch in essence from the Land Lighthouse on the east to Ravine Park on the west um, and is a mix of recreational, commercial and industrial properties. So with that, we'll get on with my, the presentation I have prepared for today. Maybe, <laughs> there we go. So the mission and vision statements for the Port Authority, um, you can see here that the mission statement is to further industrial, commercial and recreational opportunities on Presque Isle Bay and the adjacent waters. And the vision statement, of course, is what we'd like to see the Bayfront moving forward, which includes all of those opportunities as well as some residential um, all of which are supported by a successful multimodal transportation system. 
So as I mentioned in the introduction, I would like to go through some of our capital assets. So we have industrial assets and those include everything you see here on the screen. And a picture is worth a thousand words. So I thought I would add a photograph. So most of our industrial assets are on Erie's east side. You can see here that we have the Don John shipyard facility and a great picture of a ship in dry dock. Uh, we also have what we call the Parade Street dock over here. We have Mount Fort Terminal out on the end and then 12 Fort Access Road is kind of cut out of this picture, but there's a little bit more industrial over on that side as well. So who operates our docks? That is Carmus USA. They're a Belgian company uh, with strong roots in the United States and especially in the Great Lakes. They handle bulk, break bulk and project cargo. So what does that mean? Bulk cargo are um, basically aggregates uh, through the Erie port, but anything that isn't containerized. Um, there is very little containerized shipping on the Great Lakes uh, and we are uh, representative of that. Uh, break bulk are larger pieces um, that are individual, but not necessarily, um, not necessarily, a, I don't know, what, not necessarily um, individual small enough to be unloaded um, by a conveyor belt. And then project cargo, which is a lot of what we see for international project cargo that comes into Erie. We do have the largest stiff leg crane on the Great Lakes at 300 tons. And you can see the capacity there. And most importantly, though, you can see that the port is serviced by uh, CSX Railroad. And that's very important for us when we position ourselves in looking for uh, new business at the port. Don John Shipyard and Repair uh, is roughly, uh, has a dry dock that is roughly 1,250 feet. It is one of only two dry docks on the Great Lakes capable of docking a thousand footer. That thousand foot is the maximum size of a vessel on the Great Lakes due to the lock system. So just a few photographs again, um, you can see one in the upper corner here is somewhat dated, but that is when uh, what was GE transportation would ship locomotives out of the port. Um, and then down on the other corner over here, that is a recent shipment that came in um, that was for a power company uh, down in Newcastle, PA, uh, that came in through the port of Erie. Uh, very large pieces. Some of the pieces were 100 feet long and 22 feet wide. And then of course we have Don John, and, and I like to use this picture in the upper right-hand corner uh, because it has ice floating into it. And so oftentimes we think of the waterfront as flourishing during the summertime only, but during the winter is actually when the shipyard picks up. And uh, that is when they have all of their winter work. Obviously, the vessels are out doing um, hauling cargo during the summer season. And so during the winter is when they come in. And every five years, these cargo vessels are required to be inspected, much like you inspect your car. Um, so they're inspected every five years. They have to go into dry dock. And then in the bottom left is a, uh, a tanker vessel that has been, was created and built in its entirety at Don John facility. That tanker vessel was launched from Erie. It went out through the St. Lawrence Seaway and down to Florida where its final home was. So what is the economic impact? So the Port Authority is part of the American Great Lake Ports Assist, uh, Association. And as such, they every five years look at the economic impact of maritime shipping in the Great Lakes region. The last study that was conducted was in 2018. And that study found that in Erie, we can account for 757 jobs are dependent on maritime trade, which accounts for $63 million in business revenue, $22 million in wages, and $19 million in local, state, and federal taxes. So pretty substantial here in Erie. So what are our other industrial properties? Uh, those would include 12th Port Access Road, uh, which is where many of you would know McShane Welding and Side Hill Copper Works. Uh, that property is something that we actually picked up out of bankruptcy when GEIDC went bankrupt. Um, however, we had an organizational deal with them for right from the start that allowed for us to, um, the property to revert back to Port Authority ownership after the 20th year for $10. So we just happened to pick it up a little early. 
Um, and the foreign trade zone. So what many people don't know is that the Port Authority is the grantee to foreign trade zone 247. Um, and what does that mean? That means that we have oversight over um, the subzones in all of Northwestern Pennsylvania. And you can see there on your screen um, that the subzones include the port terminal, um, actually the airport, WebTech in Lawrence Park and WebTech in Grove City, as well as Hardinger Transportation. So if we ever would like to know more about foreign trade zones, I certainly can go into that topic, but that might not be what you're looking for today. So what are some of our other assets? We have commercial assets. Um, so you can see here, marinas, water taxi, campgrounds. So when you talk about marinas, um, the Port Authority has roughly 1,227 slips on Port Authority property, and you can see them broken out below. Um, so that includes eight, roughly 850 seasonal recreational slips that are managed by others, and then the remainder are managed by the Port Authority. We have the water taxi. Unfortunately, it was not in the water this past year, but that provides multimodal transportation from Dobbins Landing over to Presque Isle State Park, um, typically from Memorial Day through October 1st. We have Lampy Campground. Um, so there, that's one of the hidden gems that well, many people in Erie don't know that we have a campground. Um, you can see right here by the photograph, it's right at the channel. Um, so 42 campsites right in that location. And the remainder of this water is actually called the Combined Disposal Facility. That is something that is um, operated by the Army Corps of Engineers where they have a location to put dredge material. Um, so the campground is actually located on top of what was land created by dredge material. So we have other commercial assets as well, recreational boat and kayak and jet ski rentals, bait and tackle, marine construction and towing and salvage services. You can see all of those there. Uh, we're very happy to um, have just entered into a lease agreement uh, with a boat service company that is going to occupy a portion of Gem City's building. So very excited that we are able to maintain that service in Erie as well. Community assets, and these are the things that for the most part are free and open to the public. So we have four free public boat launches. So those contain a total of 15 ramps um, located on both the east and west side. Of course, the iconic Bicentennial Tower on Dobbins Landing and the light, Land Lighthouse on the east side. We own and maintain almost five miles of bicycle and ped path system. And we maintain a good portion of the 12 foot wide public access. And of course, we have Liberty Park and Erie Bank Eight Great Tuesdays is our concert series. Uh, the South Pier, which is the entrance to Presque Isle Bay. And we have two park and ride facilities. And what our master plan showed us is that the Port Authority actually has 2,531 parking spaces on court property. So just a couple of photographs there of the tower, the lighthouse, the East Avenue boat launch. So we started when I was hired um, back in 20, late 2014, um, we needed to look at not only the master plan, but also setting our strategic goals, which came first. So that came and was adopted in November of 2016. So you can see the goals in front of you, of course, number one being to create and implement a master development plan. The rest are improve physical and organizational connections, further industrial, commercial and recreational opportunities and pursue organizational excellence. So the first part of the master plan was actually the economic analysis. So we, we hired a firm that went out and looked at not only Erie, but also other organizations in other areas across the country that might be similar to Erie, such as Brown County or Green Bay, Wisconsin. So the economic analysis that guided the, the master plan, what's probably most important to note is the fact that we took into account before entering into the master planning process, we accounted for the proposed development at the Convention Center Authority and with Scott Enterprises. So we looked at what their master plans had already uh, publicly announced that they were going to do. We assumed that 80% of what they were, what was proposed would be accomplished. And then we went and looked from there. So we, we wanted to look at this and we are very specific in looking at the waterfront um, 
from end to end holistically. But you can see there um, some of the things that we looked at in addition to um, not only just the proposed development, but NASIS codes, industry gains, employment, all of those to see what would make the most sense for proposing um, on Erie's waterfront. So then we moved into the development of the master plan. And so we'll just run through that somewhat quickly today. Of course, we began with an existing conditions analysis. So current and planned projects, land use, circulation, infrastructure, dredging, all of those things. And coming out of the master plan, we have seven goals. So the first goal is what we have been talking about, um, especially as part of the Bayfront Parkway project, which is to connect the Bayfront and treat it as an extension of downtown. Number two is to raise awareness and celebrate port places and activities. You know, that is something that we noticed through our public comment period that a lot of people didn't understand or know what the Port Authority assets were and who was providing the service to the community. Well, number three is to improve the experience of those who use the Bayfront. Four is to improve Port Authority infrastructure. So if you notice that it is not only a master plan, but it's also a facilities plan as well. And that was very important as we went through the process, was trying to look at ways in which we can uh, continue to invest in the infrastructure we already have. Goal number five is to envision the future of the Bayfront, and we will get to that in future slides. Improve the Bayfront uh, environment, and then of course, increase revenue generating opportunities for the Port Authority. So we divided the master plan into three separate districts. Um, so right here, starting on the west side is the Marina District. So you can see some of the, the proposed changes uh, with our master plan would be to enhance the trailhead at Cascade Creek. Um, you can see that there are some additional boat slips here that we could create at new marinas, which looks like um, in the future, there will be a demand for that, as well as reimagine Liberty Pier. So reimagining Liberty Pier was one of those items that we decided to drill down a little bit further with our consultant. Um, so this is the what is currently in our master plan. You can see here that we're looking at the potential for reimagining the entrance to Liberty Park, which is actually a, a little difficult at times to get in and, and maneuver around. This would allow you to turn right off the Bayfront Parkway and you can see here provide that straight shot of view of the water. Then in addition to that, you can see that we have also proposed some commercial development here of different varieties, um, whether it would be retail or um, a, a museum of some sort, uh, definitely maritime retail. Uh, we have in, in the plan, we also have the moving of the potential moving of the mini golf, um, as well as a playground and a workout facility. Um, so there are many places across the country that have um, what we call the playground for adults, but have workout equipment um, that allows uh, anyone to go and use it at no cost. Um, a, a water feature of some sort, and then probably most important, um, maybe not most important, but uh, what has certainly been talked about and discussed for years is the need for um, permanent facilities out um, to support the amphitheater. So where we currently have all those VIP tents um, to at some point in the future have some sort of permanent structure there with restroom facilities and the alike. Then we also have the Central Dobbins District. So this is where we discuss at length the, the connection to downtown, um, the redevelopment of the McAllister property, Dobbins Landing. Um, and this is also where, um, to Liz's point early in the study session, where West Front Street um, realignment was initially discussed. So again, like Liberty Park, uh, we did the deeper dive into Dobbins Landing uh, in that area. So you can see here what a proposed development would be a mixed, uh, a mixed use of commercial use, not necessarily residential on, on the old McAllister site. Um, the proposal to have an additional uh, dock to head out into Presque Isle Bay. And then what has certainly been probably one of the most controversial items, which is the, which is the Ferris wheel. Um, so what that is, is actually just, oops, I'm sorry, let's go back to that. Oops, all right. So what that is, 
this is um, a just a architectural or a visual depiction of another family friendly event or, or destination point other than the tower. So whether that's a, a Ferris wheel like is in so many other waterfront communities or something else that we imagine is a community, um, that's just a holding spot for it. Um, it should be noted that you know our water our master plan is uh, always a work in progress. So I am aware of the fact that the um, Cleveland um, the Cleveland Urban Institute took a look at what Dobbins Landing could look like and propose that as a park. And um, so that is certainly something that we are going to look at moving forward and having conversations prior to um, implementing our master plan as well, is taking a look at some of those ideas that have come across subsequent to the adoption of our master plan. So then we have Lampy pushing the envelope, I call it. And this is where Deputy Secretary Granger needs to plug her ears. Um, because, But I use it as an example of our consulting firm uh, really wanted us to push the boundaries a little bit of what our comfort level is. And they said to us, what happens if the port's not as big of a port? What happens if for whatever reason, shipping on the Great Lakes uh, declines and you might be able to add another dock over in this area and be able to service it from the Parade Street dock only. What would you do with this property here? Um, so not certainly not something because our, our tonnage has been going up year over year over year. So not something that we're necessarily um, anticipating happening, but wanted to make the point that we had that discussion. Um, so what they proposed here was a um, an office park. Um, you can see a new marina. Um, so we, who knows what will happen in the future? Uh, but at least we have had that discussion and their recommendation of what we might be able to do. Um, currently, we're currently doing the opposite where we have some additional need for property at the Port Authority. And again, as I mentioned, our tonnage has been increasing year over year. Um, so this is not exactly the direction we're going, but I like to use that as an example. But some of the things we are looking at um, are the possibilities of providing additional, what I call back of house services over here, putting in a new um, boat lift area here and allowing for some boat storage and other things that are currently at Liberty Park to occur over in this area. Um, that would also provide additional amenities for the campground as well as the marina. So we have an implementation schedule. Um, and as you can see here, it goes out 20 years. Uh, so if you look at where we are today in 2020, um, you know, we're roughly at number seven um, and it's the Dobbins Landing East Seawall Replacement Project, which is going to be finished up, I believe, on Friday if everything goes well. Um, so you can see that we are currently in the process of implementing. So the cost of new construction um, is roughly $215 million. Uh, and I'm going to say that, that that price is probably a little bit on the light side. Uh, just because of some of the projects we have gone out to bid on already have come in higher than what was written in the master plan in 2018, which makes sense. Uh, another point of the master plan was um, the hope that the, the Port Authority and the City of Erie could work together at some point in the future to modernize the zoning ordinance, um, design and engineering requirements. Um, so I know that my, in my previous life, I was actually the zoning officer for the City of Erie back in 2003 when we rewrote the zoning code. Um, and it really hasn't been substantially updated since then. And there are a lot of new practices. And, um, you know, at the time we used to try, we tried to make a transition a little bit to form-based zoning um, that wasn't necessarily accepted at the time, which is currently pretty much common practice. So working through some of those, and then of course, the most important part, you know, we can't do any of this without private sector partners. So if you look at project implementation, um, you can see the numbers I put next to here are that they correspond to the numbers on the implementation plan. So these are the projects that are currently either in design or construction. Um, so we're talking about the new boat lift well, that is what I mentioned over on the east side. Um, Liberty Park seawall improvements are currently underway. The Liberty Park redevelopment and gateway, I'm hoping if we are successful with our RAFP application that we will at least be able to get infrastructure, if not more, um, underway in 2021. 
State Street seawall improvement. Um, so the seawall that actually holds up State Street is compromised a little bit, not to anything that is dangerous, but it's something that we are looking um, to help the city uh, take care of because it's actually a city road at that point. We don't own the property until we get out to Dobbins Landing. So we have that in preliminary design. The Front Street extension um, project, which is complementary to the Bayfront Parkway, but separate because it is part of our master plan. We are looking at potentially expanding the campground uh, next year. And then of course, we have the ongoing projects at Don John. Um, we have out to bid currently a new crane purchase for the terminal. The Holland Public Access Fishing Pier, that's a partnership with the Sons of Lake Erie. That is under construction as we speak. Uh, we are looking at a port expansion project that is in design as well. And then Waterworks Road, and, and everybody has a different name for this road, but uh, Waterworks Road is uh, Lower Sassafras Street, Waterworks Road. It's the one-way uh, road off the Bayfront Parkway heading uh, south into downtown. Uh, we have resubmitted uh, a grant application to the PennDOT Multimodal Fund uh, that was submitted in early November, so just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and are hopeful that we will be successful in that application. It's currently in design and that we would be able to go to construction on that project if we are successful with our application um, prior to the construction of the Bayfront Parkway project. But in addition, I would also like to talk a little bit about the construction that has been completed in the last five years. So if you look through some of those projects, you may recognize uh, several of them, but really the number is is staggering and uh, it I guess I didn't even realize it until I put this slide together so in the last five years the Port Authority has completed over 21 and a half million dollars worth of projects infrastructure projects um, you, you can see Lampy Marina fuel dock um, Cascade Pier dock wall the Cascade Creek Bank stabilization phase six and I put that in there just to remind myself to, to tell you that you know we have had previous um, phases of that project as well you can see that we have put over $9 million into Don John uh, to preserve that facility and those jobs, which really hadn't had an investment since it was constructed 40 plus years ago. Our waterfront security camera upgrades, a grant from the Homeland Security, um, which actually led to, which was uh, publicized quite a bit, but actually led to the um, solving of the murder of the Leclerc murder on the boat. The Cascade Neighborhood Connection, so that is the walkway that heads from the, the bluff down to the light at Liberty Park. The amphitheater, rail siding improvements, East Avenue stormwater improvements, and I did lump the East Dobbins Landing seawall into this section just because we are pretty confident it will be complete this week. So we've had a lot going on over the last um, several years and we have a lot more to come. And with that, that completes my presentation. Brenda, that was amazing. I learned more than um, <laughs> than I had up to this point. You know, I think sometimes you've come to some caucus sessions, but having the time and the visuals is really important. I had like five really quick questions. Um, and one of them, the first one that came to mind was, you know, we talked about the water taxi. I know that a few years ago, EMTA had also talked about, you know, possibly taking that over. And we've had so much discussion about access to the Bayfront, but there's also been uh, various, you know, proposals to improve access to the Prescott State Park. Um, EMTA has had the, the free uh, bus service, for, you know, previously from the Wisteria Plaza. Do you know, and I love the water taxi. I have to say, whenever my family comes to town, whenever friends come from out of town, I'm always like, we have to go on the water taxi. And so That's I great, did, thank you. Did miss it this past summer. But are there any ways to make that um, like more affordable? I mean, or in a partnership, is there any pursuit of that to try, I mean, for me, I can do it, but I couldn't do it like every week for a family of say four to get to the beach that way. So that's that's one question, or maybe maybe that's more a suggestion. Um, can I can I tackle can I tackle them one at a time? Sure, that would be good. Thank okay. you. 
Great, thank you. I, I'm, I'm just afraid I'll forget. So, uh, me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes, Liz, I couldn't agree with you more. That is certainly one of the challenges um, that we have had with the water taxi um, is the fact that even at the rate that we um, currently charge, regardless of the operator, it's it's been a losing battle. Um, so I have had some preliminary discussions um, prior to last season um, related to trying to find ways to subsidize that a little bit more. Um, I always said that uh, when you know there was discussion of the tunnel from the east side over to Presque Isle, I said take that 200 million and make the, the water taxi free, and we'll all be we'll probably all be better <laughs> off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, so yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and um, we have talked with the EMTA, um, and that will probably be an ongoing um, conversation. They have been our partners in that um, in the water taxi since day one, uh, since we wrote the grant, and it's kind of uh, shocking to think that uh, in, in looking at some of the information, uh, those water taxis have been in use for 20 years. Wow. Wow. That's a great answer. And if you need, you know, um, if you need uh, cooperation from city council, probably not budget wise, but in terms of um, support wise, you know, please let us know about that. My second question, I'm jumping from the water to the land. Okay. Um, What's the status of the land lighthouse? And I think that the Presque Isle partnership had reached out on that, but I don't know for sure because I'm not a member of the, Pre I'm not a member of the lighthouse association, but um, is there anything we need to know about the future of the land lighthouse and um, like visitor tourism opportunities with putting our lighthouses kind of, I don't know, all together, not all together, but you know what I mean. Is there anything happening there that would be useful for us to know? Liz, I am hoping that we will be able to make an announcement very soon that will uh, allow us um, to provide the land lighthouse, um, access to the land lighthouse more frequently. Um, and I think that uh, if everything goes well, I would have to say that probably in January of, of 2021, we'll be able to make that announcement. Okay, I'm getting ahead of you. Then my third question was, I wasn't sure where the trailhead is at Cascade Creek. Is that where that little footbridge is or? Yeah, so you certainly can pull down into what used to be Sunrise. Um, right. Yeah, uh, pull down and park there. And then yes, you can take the pathway down um, to that footbridge. Um, now we have recognized that the footbridge um, certainly uh, need some additional assistance. And we have had Coastal Zone Management and DEP down there to look for uh, funding opportunities to um, be able to mitigate, actually probably do a, a phase seven of the Cascade Creek remediation project and stabilize the bank, um, which it tries to make a tight turn to the west um, and the water wants to go straight. So um, okay. yeah, that's exactly where it is. Yeah, because I saw, you know, one time when I was down there, I saw that the footbridge has, you know, you, it's, inaccessible right now. And in doing some research, I discovered a great story from is probably 2007 about, um, you know, the pathways there. And I've always been amazed at, at going down there just because, you know, you see the different landforms and everything. So I just, I wanted to make sure I, I w was geographically, I knew what, what, what you were talking about when you talked about the trailhead. And then, um, I just was down at the East uh, Dobbins Landing. I think it was yesterday. You know, I looked at the seawall. That looks, you know, this nice etched writing on there. I think, if I'm yes. thinking it correctly. Mm -hmm. But I was. What were the? What will those indents be? Is that for like trees or you know? There's like a, like the circular. Yeah, like kind of a half oval or something. I just was curious yeah. what that was. Yeah, that will that will be landscaping. Okay. So obviously not at the, not, not now, uh, but in the spring, we will certainly get that landscaped. Okay. And then these are two more quick questions. I know um, we talk a lot about grants and I referred to you having followed the port for many years. I, I know that um, once upon a time, the port had a nice uh, pot of money, I think from a railroad settlement, but would it be, where would we find, like, you know, I, I really liked your introduction to that brief history about the you know, the city port commission and then the state enabling legislation. But in addition to grants, 
Um, can we access the budget on your website? And would you also be able to um, email us this uh, uh, PowerPoint? Because I it was really good. Um, you didn't go too fast, but there was a lot to absorb there. And I think the visuals and each um, you know bullet point is really helpful for us for getting us. So kind of like maybe you could answer the question. I'm not sure how how your budget comes in addition to grants, but also maybe uh, let us have access to the PowerPoint. So one's a request and one's more like a like a, again a, a quickie lesson in how the port authority is funded. Is it from the state, sure. the bulk of it, or no? So, look? so actually, um, the the Port Authority budget. When I first came on, it was subsidized slightly um, by the state. And when I was first hired, they they gave me the charge to um, remove ourselves from that subsidy, um, so that we were were fully covering all of our operational expenses on our own. Um, and we have successfully done that. Uh, so that's that was kind of a proud moment, and it happened sooner than um, I think anybody expected. Uh, but we like just like you, we tightened our belt and we looked at uh, other revenue opportunities, and um, we were able to do that. Uh, which at this point, um, so most of our grant writing or all of our grant writing actually um, goes towards capital improvements. So when I looked at the twenty one and a half million dollars, those are actually projects that are are above $100,000 or more. I didn't even count all the smaller projects. Um, so uh, our operating budget is actually through um, our land leases and property leases. So we are fully sustained by that. Um, so we have three very large uh, lease tenants uh, and then a number of smaller ones. And yes, you're, we can certainly share our budget. I actually um, just sent a copy over to the city and uh, Paul Lichtenwalder requested an additional copy um, within the last probably two weeks or so. Um, but every year annually, we do send a copy over to the city um, as part, it's a requirement actually, I believe of the state law uh, that we share our audit with you. Thank you for indulging me with all my questions. So yeah, no, happy to, thank you Liz. Thanks much. Um, I'd like to piggyback on uh, where Liz started <laughs> uh, about expanded um, use possibly of the of the water taxi. And it would seem that uh, it would also be a good thing to, if you could establish a pickup, I don't know if it's possible or not, from the east. Um, from the East Avenue dock East also, Avenue dock also because that's one of the one places of the where, where uh, the people on the east on side, side don't have don't access, access to get to, to Prescott. The EMTA bus leaves from Pittsburgh Avenue, which is a long ways away from where a lot of the people in this city live. And so I think that there might be people who like to explore that possibility. And you know, when you're looking for funding and things, you know, an expanded reach in serving other communities may be a way to attract uh, more people to want to fund it. Thank you, I, I agree. And at one point we actually did have pickup on the east side um, and I don't know the history of that fully to share that with you. I can certainly look into um, why that stopped, but I, it may have been due to a lack of, um, a lack of interest uh, but that is certainly something that we can continue to look at. I guess so everybody knows, Brenda, because it's a losing venture for the Port Authority, but it hasn't been operating because... This past year, it didn't operate basically because of COVID. Um, it operated the year prior, um, and, and then we were off a year, and then it operated in consistency, consistently um, for a number of years before that. And do you have to get actually a licensed captain to run that? Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. That's probably a major part of the expense, I'm thinking? or It, it is. When we have always um, entered into management agreements uh, with the private sector to operate the water taxi. Um, and, and honestly, we subsidize it above that. So the, the private operator has the ability to, um, they have to show us all of their books and everything, but they have the ability to um, take all of the revenue from there. Um, 
we have even given them the water taxis for free, subsidized fuel, um, and they still can't make a go of it. Okay. You actually own some, the boat we, we or own, the taxi? Yes. Yep, we okay. own all the boats. How many are there? Three. Three of them, okay. Mm -hmm. There are two water taxis and one that's called the Canadian Sailor. Thank you. Hi, Brenda. This is a Dave Brennan. Um, thanks for coming to the uh, presentation today. It's really great information, a lot of good updates. Um, I had a question about the, um, I know it's been in the news lately and you know, a lot of people are talking about it, but the Erie Coke plant. Is there anything you could tell us about that? Um, I'm not sure how much involvement you've been in, but um, we've been hearing a little bit about it. Okay, uh, sure. Um, I don't know if I know anything more than, than you might know, but um, the, the information I have is, and I have been talking with EPA, is that um, they are currently on site. Uh, they have a roughly $6 million uh, remediation project underway uh, in which they are going to be removing all the hazardous material from the site. Um, and they are doing that through their super fund. So there are actually two different types of super fund. There's the immediate need super fund that takes care of um, issues such as Erie Coke where there are tanks of hazardous material um, or hazardous material on the ground um, that when a company walks away um, and it is not being regularly uh, watched and that lack of oversight could cause a spill or anything else, uh, they come in and they clean that up. So that is currently what's going on with um, the EPA on that site. Um, that does not mean that they have uh, main, that the EPA has taken ownership uh, ownership still remains with Erie Coke, um, and then the mortgager has not yet filed for um, foreclosure yet. Okay, so, so there's nothing really in the master plan yet. You're kind of just waiting to see what's going to happen there. I wasn't sure if there could be any, any assistance or anything there. No, I, I, we will certainly continue to follow that um, okay. as best we can. You can see that in the master plan, we do talk about Erie Coke. Um, we did, um, through our planning process, identify that that would be a great uh, recreational area to expand uh, our campground and our marina, um, as well as add an additional park on the east side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. I agree with all of my colleagues that uh, you certainly have outdone yourself in your presentation. And uh, I uh, also would love to have uh, a visual sent because uh, there, there was a lot covered today. Thank you very much for that. Um, Brenda, I participated in that survey that you did, the West Front Street survey. Yes. When is that road uh, going to um, begin and who came up with that idea of the road? So you may have saw, seen that the road was actually in our master plan um, and I can probably get back to There we go. Um, so you can see that the road was actually discussed in our master plan um, to have the ability to continue um, the East Front Street over to the west side and have that connection so that um, anybody who is participating um, in activities on the waterfront doesn't necessarily have to go back out to the Bayfront Parkway. Uh, so that's really where this originated, was part of our master plan. Um, we are hopeful uh, that we will be able to go out to uh, bid in early spring of 2021 uh, and have that entire project completed uh, prior to the Bayfront Parkway construction project beginning. Thank you. And um, let's say that I um, am a new family and I'm staying at the campgrounds and I want uh, to know what to do with my family. What can you tell me? It, I, I guess I would ask a whole lot of questions on uh, what your family's interests were. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot to do in Erie and there's a lot to do in the waterfront. Um, so, I mean, we have bike ped paths through the whole, with, throughout the waterfront. We have Liberty Park, we have the playground, we have um, the, the 
Bicentennial Tower. Um, we're hoping to have additional commercial development if we can get utilities at Liberty Park. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot to do and that's just, um, you know, within bicycle distance of the campground. Above and beyond that, if you like wineries, you can go to wineries. If you like shopping, you can go to the mall, you can go downtown, lots of different things. Um, Smuggler's Wharf has been closed. Do you own that property? We do not, no. Okay. And um, how, the taxes, you, the, the things that you own, you pay taxes on? We pay taxes on some of the, we pay taxes on our commercial developments. Um, we do not pay taxes on Liberty Park um, and, and other oh, assets gosh. like that. But we do pay taxes on, you know, Wolverine Park, and we do pay taxes on McAllister. Um, the Port Authority properties themselves, if you look at all the marinas included, um, that we do and do not operate. So we pay taxes at the campground, we pay taxes at Liberty or at uh, Lampy Marina. Um, Port Authority properties generate over 420, if I remember correctly, $420,000 worth of property taxes on an annual basis. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, is Nick Scott's plans connected to your plans? How, how does that all work? Uh, so we do work with the Scots, um, but, and they're connected because they're an adjacent property owner and, uh, to us. Um, as I mentioned earlier in, the, um, earlier in my uh, presentation, uh, when we, prior to even starting our master plan, we looked at what the Scots proposed. We looked at what Casey, who's going to talk to you in a little bit, proposed um, and took all of that into account, um, not wanting to step on any toes of, of individuals that have already proposed great projects on the waterfront. Um, but above and beyond that, um, that is private property and they are um, developing, it, developing it in stages. Thank you. And um... There is a, um, um, a pier or like a fishing pier that you can't use right now um, by the um, yacht clubs area. Is that be, it's because it's being repaired? Oh, are you talking about the public access? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there are uh, some places that public access is currently restricted um, due to uh, detrimental conditions. Um, and yes, those are all in the process of um, being permitted to be repaired. And then um, I, my, uh, we, uh, excuse me. I walk along the uh, pathway around the Marriott and the Sheraton area. There's um, around the convention uh, the Erie Event Center there, and there's some rough spots there, and, and you're fixing those along the waterway. Is that what you're talking about, like the dock walls? Um, no, actually, I think Casey may be able to address that a little more. Um, if you're talking about, you're talking about rough spots in the, in the concrete? Yes. Pathway? Okay. Yes, yeah. along the water, along the water. Um, by the Sheridan, like as you're on one side looking at the Sheridan on the other side. Okay, yeah, Casey might be able to address that a little better for you. He, while we have a good portion of East Dobbins Landing, he has West Dobbins Landing. Right, thank you. And then um, because I participated in the West Front Street survey, I got all that information that was kindly emailed to me and a lot of people had addressed the mini golf. So I'm hoping to see that the mini golf uh, will go through. We have it in our master plan and uh, you know, that's an ongoing negotiation and um, you know, we're hopeful as well. Brenda, part of the front street extension project is what sort of took away from the mini golf. What does that cost the port? And couldn't that be added on with the Bayfront Improvement Project since that would be a 
access road while the project is being implemented? Uh, that we, we had that conversation in the beginning and the roadway really because it's in our master plan and it, um, it doesn't necessarily meet the purpose and need of the larger Bayfront project, meaning the Bayfront project could go through with or without that roadway. Um, it's just not something that they, that fits within PennDOT's funding model at this point. And they, they had no interest or we, we didn't ask them or we didn't approach them on it. So th this is Jen, Jen Granger, Brenda, I can, I can answer this. So Jim, that, that parcel, um, that's owned by the Port Authority that they, they lease to their, their tenant, the, the mini golf folks, mm -hmm. that, that is directly impacted as a result of the project being led by the Port Authority. So it, it would not be included um, as part of the overall Bayfront Connector project. Again, that project is independent utility. So meaning if the Bayfront Parkway is built and that isn't, it's still the, the parkway project still operates on its own and vice versa. So if it takes, you know, five years to build the parkway and the pedestrian access, the, the, the roadway that um, the Port Authority has proposed um, as part of their, their long-term strategic plan, it does complement the parkway because we're, we at PennDOT are always happy to see that compatibility. We want to see land uses. We want to see people talking but it's, it's not part of that overall project. And I know originally there was some thought about it, but again, um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a Port Authority project. And just for the good of the group, if you're wondering why I'm on the call tonight for Brenda's presentation. So I, I am the Deputy Secretary for Multimodal Transportation. So that covers everything other than highways. So I'm very, very fortunate in that I get to work with the three ports in the Commonwealth and I cannot say enough amazing things about Brenda. This slide alone that shows $21 million plus of things getting constructed, that is really um, an amazing accomplishment for, I, I just, again, for her and the board, I could not be more proud of them. They really, um, they have an incredible dynamic in, in Erie. So it's not just industrial and commercial, there's recreation. We're looking at all kinds of different improvements here. Um, and we've been very fortunate to, to work with Brenda and this board um, to get these, these great things done there um, within the city. Ms. Granger, Granger. just say just if the board did go did through go with that, that Front Street, Street extension, extension. Would, Would the Pentagon have um, possibly initiated something like that where it could have been part of that plan, improvement plan? No, it's again, Jim, because it's her, it's part of the Port Authority strategic plan, it, it lies with them. Okay. I guess, and I'll be honest with you, I know there's a few of us that um, are mainly concerned about possibly one business down there that is gonna lose their location and uh, just didn't know if there was a way to subsidize that business, business losing a business in the city. Losing a business in the city. And if the and state if the could state be part, be of, part the, of the, um, answer the help in relocating. And again, Jim, those are, I believe, negotiations currently ongoing with the port. So uh, again, PennDOT, we are not part of that process. So I can't speak to that. And Brenda, I'm not sure if, if you're able to speak to that status either, but I did see again in their overall plan um, they had, you know, potential relocation sites um, for that. So I don't know if that's compatible with it. Again, I haven't gotten into that that detail and discussions with Brenda, but I, with that, <laughs> I'll turn it back to Brenda. All right. Thank you.
No, and thank you. Unfortunately, like I mentioned before, I really can't because of ongoing conversations and both of us being represented by council. Uh, it just that really isn't anything that I can discuss right now on the back and forth um, of where we are in that process. Okay. But I guess, um, you know, to uh, Jen Granger's point, she's not the only one who's lucky. We are extremely lucky that we have somebody like um, Deputy Secretary Granger, uh, who happens to just love Erie. Um, and a good portion of what you're looking at on the screen right now um, would not have been possible without multimodal transportation funds. Um, so a lot of those projects, especially when you're looking at Don John, um, when you're looking at the Cascade neighborhood connection, um, when you're looking at the, the dock walls, um, those, all of those things come from uh, Pennsylvania Department of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation multimodal funds. Um, you know, we are, we have been looking at all sorts of different grants. Um, as I mentioned, we have Homeland Security grants, we have DEP grants, we have Coastal Zone grants, um, but by far uh, the most substantial projects that we are able to complete is due to the Department of Transportation. And much like Liz, I love the water taxi too. It's a great asset. It really is. I love the water taxi too. I uh, go on it every year. Um, when people come to town and um, I used to go on the Little Toot and uh, other boating excursions across the lake. Um, when I was in high school, I remember getting on and it would drop us off uh, near Beach 11. We had to walk a beach access road and uh, that's how we went to the beach sometimes across that. I thought that was pretty cool if they could do something like that again. Um, getting back to uh, the West Front Street survey, um, a lot of people mentioned that the mini golf would be a wonderful asset. And I know that it is because I play it every year, but because I actually walk that way, um, almost on a daily basis, really. I count there's like 50 trees. I'm a huge tree lover and there's mature trees. There's there's like at least 50 trees. I'm just wondering, do you have to take all of those trees out? Like, do you know anything about how many trees will have to be removed and replanted? Because usually when there's replants, they're just like little babies and it takes years to get them to look the way they are today? Um, Kathy, actually, uh, just late yesterday, I received a preliminary copy of a landscape plan. Uh, we did direct KCI Technologies, who is the engineer on the project, to save as many as possible. Um, I do know that we have saved some. Some of, some of the trees may have been an argument uh, to save when you're talking to, no offense to engineers, but when you're talking to some engineers, it's sometimes easier just to take them out. Um, but we are we are doing everything we can to save as many of those trees as we possibly can. Thank you very much. And um, I'm also excited about the Erie Land Lighthouse because I've had uh, people ask about being able to uh, access that. And I think that would really be uh, very helpful and building up that east side area. You, I, I know it is like Coke plant property. Will that ever become Port Authority property? Could you make that into a beach or something? Um, we, I, we don't know. Um, you know, it, 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 that'll take time, but know that we are um, putting effort towards uh, accomplishing the goal of acquisition, which is again mentioned in our master plan. Right. Uh, another area that I, I, I do like to frequent is uh, going down near that Lampy campground area. Uh, I've never camped down there, but I, uh, I imagine, uh, you know, that's definitely a hot spot. I used to uh, go camping back in the day, but now because of my back, I can't. Uh, that's unfortunate, but yes, it is. We, um, it's very popular. Um, it's sold out at least every weekend. Uh, waiting lists on some weekends um, and throughout the week, which is why we're looking to 
uh, expand that area as well. And, and, and actually an interesting note, um, that property that we created, Lampy Marina and the campground and the dredge disposal facility uh, was actually donated to the Port Authority by um, the former owners of the Erie Coke site long, long ago. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's nice that they, they did that. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I do have one other question for you. In your master plan, you were implementing that whether we had bayfront improvements or not, or or was that part of their improvements also? In other words, if the bayfront improvement project was not going to happen, were you still doing your master plan? Yes. Yeah, the, the need for an additional access road. I mean, we all use it as the cheater road, um, you know, to take as us the I back did, way, the I back have. way to the convention center. Yeah, um, but no, that 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 road needed to occur regardless of what happened um, with the with the Bayfront Parkway, um, just for connectivity purposes. Okay, I didn't know with the uh, State Street um, intersection there if this alleviated some of the traffic of the new design and that's why maybe it would have had to have been expanded. Yeah, no, no, um, we would have done this regardless, just like there's an East Front Street and there's a need for East Front Street that connects. In other words, I'm trying to get the state to pay for this, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Jim, you're killing me. You're killing I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. Brenda, yeah, in your ahead. in your dredge area around that area, um, do you have like uh, the scientists who study wildlife come down there? Are there any um, natural species that? Uh, really need to uh, call that their home and continue to call that their home. Um, do we have to be careful about any uh, birds of prey or, or uh, any natural habitats in that area? Um, I guess you always have to be careful, uh, but that, that dredge disposal area is actually uh, monitored and um, utilized exclusively by the Army Corps of Engineers. And truthfully, they haven't deposited anything in there in um, probably a decade or more. It is very cost prohibitive to use, um, which is um, which is unfortunate because as I talk with my counterparts across the Great Lakes, they, they're looking to build those. Um, and we, we aren't using ours for multiple reasons, including um, open water dredging. So we can dredge and um, or the, the feds can come in and dredge and then go deposit it in Lake Erie out in the water and doesn't have to be disposed of in that way. So, um, I mean, it's a, the South Pier is a public uh, access point. Um, so those that choose to recreate there um, do. I don't have any knowledge of specific um, studies or specific individuals that are following bird migration patterns or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering that. Is there any other questions from council? Not a question, but just a comment. Um, really hoping that for the next port meeting that, you know, that it could be Zoom enabled because um, this is a really good start to communication. And I think we realized, you know, we had that very lengthy public hearing about um, the removal of the CSX tracks. And I know that, you know, there are some who thought we were trying to hold things up. But it really, we heard new voices. Um, people are very energized and engaged about the future. I, I should say the current state and the future of the Bayfront Parkway, both the, the near future and the long term. So you know, where, whatever you can do to um, allow people to observe your meetings um, would really be appreciated. So thank you for sending the Zoom link to me, but I hope that, um, 
know, maybe you can uh, enable that for um, when you have your monthly meetings. Um, I, although I don't, I, maybe you don't meet in December. I'm thinking uh, maybe we do. you do. And, and do. I just realized that I forgot to, you, one of the questions you asked in the beginning is when do we meet? Um, so we do meet the second and fourth Wednesday of every month at noon. Um, however, in November and December, we have only one meeting because the fourth Wednesday often falls too close to the holiday. Um, I, so, yeah, I sort of remembered that, that there was a change. So anyhow, thanks. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I know that you've given us a, a lot to, uh, to chew on and I learned a lot. So, and I also think that um, having both Port Authority and conventions, I'm sorry, Erie events, as I said, at the same table, even though virtually is um, a, a really positive reflection about what we can do with collaboration and that all important communication. So thank you. Thank you, I agree. And Casey and I work together well. And so I guess we'll turn the stage over to him. That sounds like a plan. Thank you again. I, I can imagine this really took a long time on your part, but it really was excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that compliment. Thank you. Casey, you're with us? I am, can you hear me? Yes, good to Great see you. Uh, the pleasure is mine and good evening members of council and uh, those from the public that may be uh, participating in this via Zoom. My name is uh, Casey Wells. I'm the executive director of the Erie County Convention Center Authority. And uh, our authority uh, originally started as the Erie Civic Center Authority in the late 70s to, that was formed to manage then the uh, Erie Civic Center Authority's only asset, uh, the Warner Theater. The Warner Theater was literally saved from the wrecking ball by uh, Mayor Lou Tulio, who convinced the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to purchase the theater in the late 70s, and, uh, which was done. And then the, the city created the Erie Civic Center Authority to manage and operate the Warner Theater. The, uh, the process continued relative to the Civic Center's uh, development of additional public assembly facilities with uh, the addition of the uh, then Erie Civic Center, um, then subsequently the Tulio Arena and is known today the Erie Insurance Arena, which was built in 90, 1983, opened in 1983 and uh, Obviously, uh, 2013, I believe it was, uh, was uh, completely renovated with about a $52 million renovation to upgrade it from, uh, uh, from the way it was built in 1983. In 1995, um, the city, uh, uh, in cooperation with the authority, uh, uh, built uh, the uh, Jerry Oid Ballpark to accommodate the Erie uh, baseball team, and that opened in 1995. In uh, 2000, after uh, um, approximately 20 years of the Erie Civic Center Authority operating uh, the uh, three facilities, the theater, the arena, and the ballpark, and relying exclusively on funds from the city of Erie's general fund which averaged anywhere between 180 and 260, range between uh, 180 and $260,000 a year from the city's general fund budget that was necessary to provide operating subsidies for the facilities to um, continue to uh, serve their mission. Um, the amount of funding that the city uh, uh, provided the Erie Civic Center Authority was considerable but candidly never enough to, uh, to allow for strategic and continued reinvestment in those facilities. Um, it was a burden on the city, which was uh, understandably and rightfully corrected in 2000. Clearly these are regional assets enjoyed by many people, not only city dwellers, but those who live in the county, as well as in the tri-state area and region. And region. So in a, about 2000, um, uh, legislation was uh, put forward. And let me back up. At the time of the Erie Civic Center, all of the appointments were made by uh, city council, had one each, and the mayor had four for an 11-member 
uh, board uh, in 2000, again, to try to um, lessen or eliminate the taxpayer burden, which was exclusively on the city of Erie's budget. Um, it was uh, advanced that it should be considered a regional asset and be funded uh, more regionally. And in 2000, the Erie Civic Center Authority became the Erie County Convention Center Authority through an act of state legislation that created a new authority. Um, I remember working for two boards for a period of time and they worked side by side, although some members were did serve on both the Erie Civic Center Authority and were retained and, and uh, subsequently um, uh, worked for the, uh, served on the Erie County Convention Center Authority Board of Directors. Um, that uh, reconstituted uh, the composition of the board whereby each county council district was afforded one uh, seat on our board, uh, which, which was seven. Of course, there's seven county council members. Uh, the mayor of the city of Erie is, uh, uh, appoints two of our board members, and the governor of Pennsylvania appoints two of our board members for an 11-member board. They serve without compensation, four-year terms, the uh, terms cycle, uh, with, with some appointments uh, opening every year. So there's no um, overall or drastic change with members. Uh, basically every year, a couple of board members term expires, whether it be city and or county and or governors. Um, these individuals continue to serve uh, until their terms expire. And at that time, the representative uh, appointing person uh, can then either choose to uh, replace uh, those no, board members know. and or reappoint them. If there's no action taken, okay. they continue to serve until uh, reappointed. Um, the authority um, uh, has, uh, uh, obviously that, that was a major sea change relative to, uh, to the city's budget. It, it, you know, it was about a quarter of a million dollars a year that no longer had to come out of the city general. And, and then as that board change uh, uh, happened, uh, a new funding source was created whereby we are uh, supported exclusively by the hotel bed tax in Erie County, which is at 7%. We get four of the seven percentage points for our operation. The other three percentage points are, uh, are uh, uh, given to uh, uh, visit Erie or the CVB, our tourism agency for uh, Erie County. Um, the other than that, the, the, actually, there are no local residents uh, paying taxes to support any of our operations. Uh, no, no county tax uh, goes to us, no city tax goes to us. It's exclusively, exclusively uh, generated by those who are visiting hotels uh, within the county of Erie. Um, and uh, that has provided us with sufficient uh, dedicated revenue source to not only allow us to subsidize the operation of our facilities, um, but also allow us to uh, invest in strategic initiatives for transformational community, uh, community projects to uh, um, generate uh, economic development, economic spending, um, and improve the quality of life in our community. In 2007, uh, the Bayfront Convention Center opened. Uh, and in 2008, the Sheraton Hotel opened. Uh, and in 2013, the Courtyard Hotel opened. Um, the uh, Erie County Convention Center Authority is our official name or more commonly and branded as Erie Events. Uh, Erie Events owns all of those uh, aforementioned properties. However, we do not manage the two hotels. We subcontract that management um, to a third party independent uh, hotel operator, uh, White Lodging out of Merrillville, Indiana. One of the premier hotel operators uh, in, the, in the world for that matter. And they get a fixed fee for their management services. So if our hotels do especially well, they get X amount of dollars. If they do poorly, they get X amount of dollars. 
And that was a requirement that had to be relative to a arm's length relationship as required by the Internal Revenue Service that, that required us to have that uh, financial compensation plan and program with, uh, with White Lodging. Uh, they are not at risk. Um, they get a fee for their services, uh, come hell or high water. Um, the only thing that is relative to their compensation is the timing. If the hotels perform poorly, we don't necessarily have to pay them their fixed management fee. Uh, we will owe it to them, but it is deferred until the uh, hotel operations generate sufficient revenues to make those management payments. Uh, our hotels were guaranteed by the full faith and guarantee of the taxpayers of Erie County through legislative action taken by County Council. Uh, at the time, uh, they did that for both the uh, Sheraton property as well as the Courtyard property. Essentially, having that uh, guarantee by the county significantly reduced the cost of borrowing, which generated additional millions of dollars that would otherwise have gone into debt service that was now available to build these hotels with the sufficient number of rooms and of the sufficient quality deserving of our community, particularly uh, properties on Erie's magnificent waterfront. Um, that enabled us to build 200 rooms, that enables to build uh, in the Sheraton and 190 some rooms in, in the courtyard and build them to such of a quality that would rival anywhere in uh, the country to allow us to uh, uh, better position us for success because of the quality of the properties and the quantity of rooms. Uh, both of those hotels were right size for the square footage in our uh, convention center. And all of that was determined by a number of rigorous studies to do our due diligence to be sure that we were doing it um, uh, properly and that they would be sustainable. They've been very successful by every measure, both from an economic sense and a, and a, um, a patron experience and hotel feedback. Uh, we have the number one Sheraton uh, uh, overall in North America, the best uh, hotel, uh, Sheraton hotel bar and restaurant in North America. And our courtyard uh, is always in the top percent of all courtyards uh, throughout our country. So we're very proud of that. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll mention relative to our communication with council, you know, we do have a council appointed liaison to our authority, Ed Brzezinski, that I understand could not be part of tonight's meeting, but Ed uh, communicates with our board and myself uh, regularly. He attends meetings and has been uh, uh, very active and proactive relative to keeping abreast with uh, authority operations and, uh, and strategic initiatives. Um, we hold our meetings on the third Thursday of uh, every month at three o'clock at the Bayfront Convention Center. We have the luxury there of having a tremendous amount of very large spaces. Um, we have the public uh, uh, continuing to visit um, and because we have the ability to have all of the CDC protocols followed because of the expanse of space that we have there to allow everyone in attendance to have very generous and uh, uh, beyond what is the requirements as, uh, as uh, dictated by uh, the CDC as well as uh, local health uh, guidelines. The, um, the uh, uh, COVID has, has decimated our operations to put it frankly. I, I would offer that there is no business or industry that has been a, has had a COVID hasn't had a greater effect on any business or industry than it has the Erie County Convention Center Authority, um, whether it be hospitality, food, beverage, hotels, um, public assembly facilities. Um, it has devastated our operation and the negative impact of COVID to 2020. Of course, the year's not yet over but we estimate it to be in the magnitude of $7 million negative uh, impact by uh, this awful COVID pandemic. Um, we have uh, 
obviously canceled an entire baseball season. Uh, hockey season was abbreviated. Basketball was abbreviated. All the dance concerts, graduations, Philharmonic, uh, brought, just, just name it, nothing has happened. Uh, when public assembly is prohibited, one would easily uh, understand that public facility, uh, assembly facilities would be accordingly um, uh, decimated. Um, unfortunately, because of our governmental status, we did not qualify for any federal COVID help, PPP, or any other CARES program funding. The only place that we qualify, um, and even that is under review and subject to argument, is uh, through the County of Erie. The County of Erie uh, obviously has the super re representation of board members of the Erie County Convention Center Authority or Erie events, that's seven of 11. So we have been working with the county uh, to secure some of the COVID funds, the $25 million that were provided, federal COVID funds that were provided to uh, the county through uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The county has uh, granted us $2.575 million, uh, and which certainly helps when you have a $7 million issue. Um, we are currently discussing and are hopeful that they will release another $2.1 million um, to satisfy the $4.6 million, uh, uh, which was our original request. We, we basically pared down the $7 million and said, you know, it's not what we lost. We, we got to really uh, focus and tighten our belts and identify um, how much do we really have to have to remain uh, solvent and to be, continue to move forward. And it's 4.6 million and the county has to date provided more than half of that and we are especially grateful for the county's uh, uh, support in, in helping us in this uh, very, very difficult period. Um, when COVID came upon us in, in March of this year, um, at the end of March, we furloughed 95% of our employees, um, including myself. I'm, I'm half time uh, and I'll use that as the excuse why I did, I have no staff, it's myself and a handful of folks maintaining our 250, 280 million dollars worth of assets um, with very little activity, but you still need to mow grass, you still need to do certain things to make sure our systems are operating. But everybody, 95% uh, uh, of the hours of uh, uh, budgeted for our organization, which uh, there's a handful of people that are continuing to work on a part-time basis, uh, and I'm one of those. Um, the 95% are gone. It's, it's uh, saved us about a million and a half dollars. We did that in, uh, in, uh, in March and it's been very, very difficult, not only to our organizations, but to our employees. And that's 95% of full-time employees. All part-time employees are also furloughed. furloughed. That's a 100%. Uh, and now I'm not including the $1.5 million savings. That does not even count part-timers. Part that is only full-time employees. So it is, um, it's been very, very difficult. What makes it even more difficult is trying to project what's gonna happen next. I think given the recent spike in Erie County, as well as around the country for that matter, um, we, we know and safe to assume that this is going to affect us uh, uh, dramatically um, for at least the first half of 2021 and likely more. I think anyone can readily accept the fact that the days are the day of having 9,000 people packed in the Erie Insurance Arena watching that the Zach Brown band, uh, I believe will return, but it isn't going to be anytime soon. So we have to deal with those realities and uh, plan accordingly. Um, we're, we're, we're continuing to work on our 2021 budget, which will involve uh, a number of very difficult decisions that will be uh, made and uh, we will be forwarding our proposed budget to uh, our board of directors um, 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 next week. Um, that said, I could talk about blue, uh, gloom and doom uh, all night, but one has to remain optimistic um, that we will get through this. We have to endure uh, the pain of today to position ourselves to be stronger in the future. And we're doing that. We currently have $43 million worth of buildings and construction projects underway. UPMC Park uh, was able to secure a uh, RCAP grant that's technically uh, a city grant. 
that we are administering and matched. We provided the, uh, the $12 million match. We provided the cost for all of the soft cost engineering fees, et cetera, of probably three or $4 million. We provided about $2 million worth of fixtures, furniture, and equipment, which is not eligible to be funded through the uh, ballpark $12 million RCAP fund. So the authority has millions of dollars invested into this project, despite the fact that it's a city uh, on paper, it's a city RCAP grant. The city built it with an RCAP grant. We felt that that would be the better um, pathway to secure the funding through the, the great efforts of, of, represent, of our, all of our local elected officials, as well as state officials. And uh, fortunately, we were able to get those funds that I believe uh, have positioned us well to be able to retain AA baseball in this community. Um, that project is going well. I do share uh, monthly project reports as well as our inclusion plan for a minority a diversity workforce to uh, the county of the city clerk on a monthly basis. I trust that that gets shared with members, members of council. That is the reason it is sent. It's certainly sent as well to uh, uh, the city administration uh, to keep uh, the council as well as the administration informed of the construction pro pro process, as well as a separate report, as I had mentioned, that talks about our um, diversity program that we embed in all of our project labor agreements um, to ensure that all representatives of our community have the opportunity to procure uh, life-sustaining wages through participation in the trades unions. Um, and we want those folks, in, and for that matter, Erie Countyans to enjoy the benefits of the uh, monies for construction to put that in the pocketbooks of Erie Countyans and, um, and the minority community. Uh, additionally, uh, the Warner Theater, um, something that uh, I began uh, working on in 1993. Um, I believe that the, I know it was my first project. Uh, of course, we have done $200 million worth of Bayfront development uh, since after the Warner started. And it's interesting that the Warner was before Bay, the Bayfront development and the final phase will not conclude until much of the Bayfront uh, in, in our master plan has been uh, for our for a Bayfront Convention Center facility has been fulfilled. Uh, the Warner scheduled to be completed in the uh, fall winter of next year, uh, and uh, it will be simply spectacular. We were able to secure additional funds through uh, local philanthropy to add about three and a half million dollars to include other program elements in the theater. And again, like these projects costs such as soft costs, design fees, engineering fees, property acquisition, all of that has been funded by the Erie County Convention Center Authority. And for the Warner alone, that's probably about four or five million dollars of, of authority funds that's going with the 16.5 million dollar uh, state funds, as well as approximately three and a half to four million dollars of, of philanthropy and donations that re we've received through very generous individuals and organizations uh, uh, in Erie. Um, we currently have a couple of projects in the queue. Um, they say if you stand still, you're falling behind. Uh, and we have a RCAP grant in for a $1.5 million grant for the clubhouse improvements at UPMC Park. The uh, uh, Recently, with all of these changes that have happened between minor league baseball and Major League Baseball, they have identified some additional requirements necessary and needed to satisfy uh, the, the professional baseball. And one area that we did not address because these elements became known to us after we had established the program, uh, let the bids and uh, construction was well along its way, that they need uh, significant improvements to the clubhouse facilities for both the home and visitors. Uh, locker rooms and clubhouses. Um, we fortunately have the space. We have done many of the things that have been required by change ordering elements uh, into the, the ballpark to do a number of things to address immediately what we could. 
Of course, the authority prior to the RCAP grant independently funded a million dollar scoreboard. And we also uh, spent about $875,000 putting in a new field system, irrigation, uh, natural grass, um, sand, subsurface, uh, and drainage. Um, and the authority funds also performed that uh, to make sure that the playing surface was safe the Tigers were thrilled with that investment. I think it showed that uh, we are committed to keep baseball in Erie. We put our money where our mouth is and subsequently uh, put a million dollar scoreboard in, which enhanced the revenue opportunities for our baseball team owner, which is necessary given that Erie, Pennsylvania has the lowest attendance of any double A franchise in the Eastern League. We have to try harder. Um, Again, the UPMC Park is nearly completed. It's fantastic. And if we didn't have COVID, we would be having a ribbon cutting and a, and, a, and, a, and a public open house. And at some point we will do that. But unfortunately, the pandemic guidelines make that not a prudent thing to do. Um, the Warner, uh, again, is, is going well. It will be fantastic. And those uh, continue. Uh, the other initiative besides the baseball clubhouse that we need to secure the funds for to retain uh, AA baseball, and we have we have had bipartisan support relative to that RCAP grant. I know uh, I had extensive conversations with Mayor Schember about the importance of that, and he indicated he was going to relay those uh, the importance of that to, to uh, the powers that be. We know that there's a lot of very worthy RCAP grants out there. And we just ask that we be considered uh, as always along them because literally the future of double A baseball could hang on our ability to improve those clubhouse facilities. Additionally, we were lucky enough to be awarded a $1.5 million grant, uh, uh, one RCAP grant funding cycle ago uh, for, the, um, for the market house down on our bayfront. Um, we have found that, uh, of course, that was, that was half of what we had asked for and we simply cannot pencil it out to, and have it be sustainable and a uh, marketplace market house of a quality necessary to meet our program goals and to quite candidly get it right. So we uh, recently submitted a $3.5 million RCAP grant to supplement what was there to uh, have sufficient revenue to build the base uh, of the uh, market house, uh, the authority has pledged again to match that five million dollar state investment. We're prepared to do that. Um, we are right now uh, considering uh, different opportunities to an advance that, but clearly um, we're uncertain of the status right now of the RCAP program because, of course, COVID has had devastating impacts uh, on the state budget as well. But those uh, projects are queued up and ready to go. If I can backtrack for a minute for the clubhouse ballpark, we have already paid for the architects to do a complete design of the ballpark uh, clubhouse improvements. That has been completed, been improved, approved by labor and industry. Um, the bid specifications, I guess we are completely ready to go, ready to go. We could go to bid tomorrow. We are queued up and ready to go when that funding uh, comes down the pike. So we've done all we can in prepare, uh, to prepare for, to expedite the process. Uh, we're sitting here hopeful that it will come uh, again. That is bid ready. Um, Bayfront Place Development, as you recall, uh, you know, we have uh, acquired the uh, uh, former GAF site down on the Bayfront through a uh, $3 million grant. Uh, and then secured another $7 million grant to remediate the property. Again, that $10 million was matched by the Erie County Convention Center Authority. And we are currently uh, negotiating and discussing development opportunities with three uh, different uh, developers. And I am hopeful and optimistic um, that uh, we can advance it and move it forward and make some announcements here but clearly I hope we would have been there by now, but COVID kind of put the whole world upside down and paused uh, our efforts, although uh, uh, discussions and negotiations are continuing. One thing I wanna alert, alert council that they may or may not be aware of, but through the course of all of these developments that I described, we have assumed 
uh, a number of projects on the city's behalf relative to investment in city infrastructure that was necessary for our development to move forward. Specifically, when we built the Erie Bayfront Sheraton Hotel, the uh, infrastructure, sanitary sewer lines, lift station, et cetera, that ran uh, from uh, State Street to, well, I shouldn't say State Street, on State Street from uh, uh, the Bayfront Parkway north to Dobbins Landing was in a significantly deteriorated condition. Uh, the authority spent $2.5 million of our funds to upgrade that entire sanitary sewer line on behalf of the city. Uh, we needed it to, uh, to, uh, to, in, to, to, to have the sufficient capacity to accommodate the, uh, the, the needs of the Sheraton Hotel. Um, the city did not have the wherewithal to make that capital investment in its sewer system. Um, we did it, uh, 2.5 million, put a brand new uh, uh, force main down there. We put in a new lift station and in cooperation and collaboration with the city of Erie, uh, the $2.5 million was actually lent to us by the city of Erie. Um, and we have been paying back the city for that investment of 2007 uh, every year. Um, and, and but roughly the payment is somewhere about $125,000 a year. So although we were responsible for that uh, capital cost, again, working with the city, uh, they provided us the money. I believe it was from the sewer and, and water fund uh, and they provided it and we are now paying it back over time. Additionally, with the Sheraton Hotel, um, the fire inspectors and safe public safety officials indicated that it would be wise and greatly improve public safety if we were able to provide a secondary water source to the hotel and Dobbins Landing area. Previously, the only water line that was servicing the dock, uh, Dobbins Landing, went down State Street, again, along with the sewer that we replaced, sewer, sewer line that we replaced. They said it would be great if we could not have a dead end there and actually loop it into our system. The authority spent about $450,000, uh, which was not reimbursed by the city. That was just a, a cost that we absorb uh, to, to put in some underwater lines linking um, the, the, the water system, uh, water service at the foot of uh, of State Street at Dobbins Landing and tied it into Sassafras Street to the waterworks. So now the public dock is actually served by two water sources, making it greatly enhancing the ability for public safety to uh, put out fires or whatever, however water would be needed um, to have uh, redundancy in uh, the supply for that area. That was about $450,000. Also, the city owned a uh, sewer lift station that was uh, right along actually the uh, proposed marginal access road or front the relocation of Front Street that Brenda previously described. There is a, uh, a, a city sewer lift station there that we had identified uh, and our engineers had identified that has uh, that wasn't uh, maintained, it had antiquated control systems, its pumps were had, uh, had cycled to end of life. And in order for us to uh, build the Courtyard Hotel on Sassafras Street, we, uh, we assumed the, the complete financial responsibility of uh, redoing that lift station uh, to the tune of about a half a million dollars, again, to benefit the city and the uh, uh, city sewer system, and of course it benefits us and all residents. In every one of these instances, we built and rebuilt these systems, all the city specifications, utilizing city uh, protocols and or pumps and systems so they could be uh, consistent with other lift stations throughout uh, uh, the city sewer system. Um, and uh, uh, we did that and basically turned it over uh, to the city. And that again ha has worked out well. Um, of course, you know that we pay approximately uh, 
$400,000 a year to the city from amusement taxes, that infrastructure payment, you know, earned income taxes, parking taxes, et cetera. And again, that's a swing from a, when I began my comments tonight, you know, um, we got about $250,000 from the city. Now we're paying about uh, $400,000 to the city. So really the swing since the Erie County Convention Center Authority change from the Erie Civic Center Authority to the Erie County Convention Center Authority. The real, the real uh, uh, great part of this for the city, and I think the community at large, is about a six to $700,000 annual swing uh, to the city's finances from what was originally a minus 250 is now uh, plus 400 uh, on average for a $650,000 annual um, improvement of the city's finances since 2000. Um, the, uh, uh, again, I talked about our funding sources. Of, uh, we do not take, pay taxes. We are a government entity. We do not pay taxes in Erie any more than the city pays taxes for the Downing Golf Course in Harbor Creek Township. Um, governments, they're immune from taxes. However, those components of our operation that are not aligned and consistent with our mission are taxable and do pay taxes, uh, both real estate taxes uh, to the county, to the city, as well as the school district. Specifically, the Cove restaurant in our parking, Sheraton parking deck as a tenant of ours, the real estate taxes for the Cove restaurant are paid. Additionally, we have the uh, Oyster bar and rooftop bar under construction at uh, Bayfront Place uh, the, in the courtyard parking deck. Um, once they get up and operating, uh, both of those businesses will also uh, generate tax monies to, um, to, to, to the state or to, to the, to the uh, school district, the city, as well as the county. Um, I guess I could go on. There's plenty to talk about, but I think it would be probably best to, uh, and I know it's, uh, you've, you've been, we've been at this for a couple of hours now, and I'd, uh, I'd offer it up to myself to, for any questions that you may have, uh, and uh, uh, we'll go from there, but thank you. Casey, I have a question. Um, you know, we've all been waiting to hear what's gonna happen with, um, you know, the minor leagues are just all up in the air. I have seen stories that the Mets and that the Mets are shuffling things. Uh, Trenton is moving uh, two, two affiliates around. Um, there are, you know, the lower level uh, teams are in many cases being eliminated. So my question is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Those clubhouse improvements um, they're a request from MLB and not from the Tigers, because I think the affiliation between the Tigers and the Seawolves has expired. So can you kind of walk us through what you know about that? Um, there are, every day somebody's reporting, it, it may be more rumors than official news, but, um, you know, a lot of baseball employees, I'm not talking about me as an usher, but I'm talking about people across the spectrum in minor league ball are trying to find out if their community is actually going to have a team. So my question is, does Erie still have an affiliation with the Tigers or did that expire? And what comes first, the, the RCAP possible grant for the clubhouse improvements or an actual um, agreement for 2021 for minor league baseball? Well, first of all, it's not a rumor. Trenton has lost its double A franchise. Right. I know that that's true. And, yeah. And, and also, and, yeah. and Binghamton is assured they are keeping their double A franchise. Right. And if you recall, Binghamton originally was on the list of contraction. They were right. scheduled to be eliminated from double A baseball, but the Mets have announced that they will retain the Binghamton, their double A franchise in Binghamton. Um, you, you offer a great question, and isn't uh, the, the chicken and the egg is a great way to put it. Uh, let me say that um, 
we will not be investing in uh, any more into Jarriott Park, or I, I am so trained at that name, <laughs> UPMC Park, um, until we have great not absolute certainty, but great certainty that we will have double A baseball here. Okay. And I will tell you that I think that we, I am optimistic that we will be able to um, secure the RCAP grant. We've already secured the match. We have to come up with a million dollars, million, million and a half match. We've done the design fees. We're ready to go. Um, from a practical matter, um, if Erie loses its double-A franchise after the Commonwealth investing millions of dollars into the facility to upgrade it to a double-A standards, um, I think we would be the poster child for the world and why municipal uh, authorities um, should not invest in, um, in professional sports. And I don't think that, uh, I, I do think that we will um, retain the double-A baseball team I would hope that that would become official within the next month or so, but I can't control that timeline. It's the Tigers. Major League Baseball has indicated recently what the new standards are for clubhouses. Mm -hmm. The Tigers have uh, are the ones that need to implement that to be sure that their affiliate is in fact compliant. Uh, we have shared all of the plans that I mentioned that are ready to bid uh, with the Tigers, they have made adjustments, they've made recommendations, but the entire process was communicative and collaborative of getting their input to be sure that what we will put to bid in fact satisfies not only the Tigers, but Major League Baseball. Um, it's been, uh, I, I've talked to and met with the uh, to Detroit Tigers uh, Director of Minor League Operations on several occasions through this process in the last year and a half and uh we are poised and ready and i'm i am i am i am cautiously optimistic that uh we're going to be able to retain our double a franchise and uh but clearly it is contingent upon a million and a half dollar investment now it may be a little less than that it, that's that's the budget that we got for what needs to be done and that that uh clearly was why we uh, made that level of request to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I know that uh, the elected officials in the Northwestern Pennsylvania delegation, as well as those who are uh, the deciders in Harrisburg are all aware of this situation. They're aware of the urgency. But again, I think that this COVID pandemic has just changed the rules of everything that we've ever done or known. So. I hesitate to speculate relative to um, to what will happen, but we continue to move forward, preparing ourselves for success, and I'm cautiously optimistic. Thanks, Casey. That's a, a really good explanation because I am well aware of, you know, the delicate nature of this, and you know, baseball is going to say the same thing. Hey, we we lost x x x x dollars because of the pandemic. But kind of moving to a different, um, kind of the same thread, but um, how, how, and I guess I could have, I, Paul Lichtenwalder isn't on here, but I've been concerned, like from when the pandemic first hit about the hit that we take on the amusement tax. And are you in communication with him as to what we're forecasting for uh, next year? Because um, you know, I was downtown the other day and you look at, you know, the playhouse is dark. Um, we don't know because of the pandemic, assuming we have baseball, we don't know if that season will even start on time. And I guess I wondered, I think Kathy had originally asked about, uh, you know, hockey. This was also supposed to be, I believe our last season for the, um, G league. So can you kind of like walk us through the other <clears throat> athletic teams that are here and whether whether you're talking to Paul about how, will we have an accurate I know we probably can't but are we taking those factors into consideration when forecasting our budget for 2021 on revenues for the amusement tax so amusement tax and then those other teams you know the, okay. the uh, I'll, I'll, G League I'll... and the Otters 
our budget is always built from the ground up, meaning we look at every event that we have in every facility in every room, uh, whether it be a banquet convention, meeting room use, arena, ballpark, and, and, and forecast what events will we host for a calendar year, which is the same as our budget year. With that budget forecast, what I mean by the ground up is we identify how many people will, what event is, is gonna take place, what's the date of that event, uh, or the likely date of that event, and how many people are gonna come to that event, and how much money are they gonna spend while they're there. It's, uh, it's really looking into a crystal ball, into a crystal ball, into a crystal ball, but having done it for many, many years and having a brilliant finance, director of finance and great uh, management team here, we can be reasonably accurate and have been forecasting what uh, is likely to transpire in any budget year. This year, all bets are off. We will be doing our very best because we have to create a budget the same way we always would, will and assume what will happen relative to the pandemic. I will tell you, we're looking at very little activity and projecting very little activity in the arena uh, for the first part of uh, 2021, we are projecting to play baseball. It's an outdoor event. The Warner Theater, it's pretty easy because we were, it's, we're closed. So budgeting the Warner Theater is really easy because we're, we have no events because it's not uh, available for events. Convention Center will probably be the first to come back to what used to be normal because it has smaller, it has multiple rooms of multiple sizes that can accommodate meetings of 20, corporate meetings of 10, uh, and a lot of other things that will allow it to, um, will allow it to basically work itself into normal operation. Um, but to answer your question in December, we will be able to provide Paul with a number of what we project the amusement tax to be. Uh, absolutely. But this year I will offer that it is, uh, uh, it's an educated guess because who who knows what this pandemic is going to cause and how long it will linger, particularly because of this, this difficult spike that we're seeing about the country. But yes, we will have a number that uh, he will be able to, uh, to incorporate into the city's budget. I'll also add though um, uh, that the authority is not subject to paying for building permit fees um, our developments and buildings are not subject to review by BUI or BIU or Ed, Ed Cardi, I think his name is, but in any event, they don't have to go through that process. Our Warner Theater is labor and industry, which is driven by the Commonwealth. The ballpark is labor and industry, which basically makes us exempt from having to to pay for building permit fees and every bit of our construction since 2000 and before we have always voluntarily paid the city building permit permit fees despite the fact that we don't have to and again um, that is again part of our contribution to the city that hosts us that helps us uh, that's our partner so you will be getting a building permit fee uh, and that's based upon you know, construction per thousand, et cetera, et cetera. And we send those to the city and have and will continue to do so. So relative to that, I would say for the city budget, uh, Paul should reach out and talk to our finance person who can share um, you know, what that will be uh, for uh, 2021. Okay, but best, best guess yeah. right now is that we aren't going to have it in late uh, 2020 or early 21. Um, we won't be having those teams at the arena. You, you're no, saying it, base, no, baseball. No, was, I only I only answered the first part of the question. Let me okay. let me address the second part of your question. Okay, thanks. We are forecasting to play hockey in February. The Ontario Hockey League has announced a return to play program that basically has training camp in the third week of January. 
with an abbreviated shortened season of 40 games, 20 home, 20 away, that will begin on or about February 4th and run into June. We are projecting to play those hockey games. The thought is that perhaps the because the borders closed and it's tough being a Pennsylvania team and a United States team in the Ontario Hockey League and if you and the borders closed and basically um, can, Canadians don't want Americans crossing the border is the gist of it. Um, and I recognize that and, and accept that. Uh, that's not to be prejudiced at all, um, but that's a reality. So the thought is that when the schedules develop, that Erie would play Saginaw and Flint uh, at the beginning of the season uh, many times to, uh, to, to preclude the need to uh, cross the border with the understanding that later in the season, perhaps it starts in February, perhaps March and April and May, they begin then their interdivision play because hopefully the pandemic will have subsided at least enough to allow border crossings and interdivision play. Um, the, uh, the, as you can imagine, there are very rigorous uh, protocols relative to COVID. We have all sorts of guidelines from the OHL, um, the NBA, and we have, uh, in April, last April, formed a tax force of our managers who have developed a very comprehensive return to events programs um, that are currently being reviewed for the convention center uh, with the Erie County Department of Health. Of course, we're setting them up, all the CDC, but you know, all eyes are good. So we're seeking feedback from the Department of Health and uh, Erie County Department of Health. And then we will, um, complete you know our draft of return to play guidelines and protocols for our arena will come next uh, we will again share those and these are these are 100 page documents uh, tremendous amount of work and effort and we put them together not only by the respective leagues guidelines but also searching for best practices of other facilities and through our professional association of the international association of venue managers of, uh, an association we belong to called Venue Coalition. Basically, all of these public assembly facilities across the country, and for that matter, North America, are sharing tremendous amounts of information that we are then gleaning the best practices from each to craft a program that makes sense for each of our respective facilities. Uh, again, a, a heck of an effort in, in our in our in our COVID return to events task force has has just done a superb job and ultimately it will get reviewed by the health department but most importantly we're going to need to share that with the public and this includes ionization things on our HVAC systems touchless points of entry uh, about about a five to six hundred thousand dollar capital improvement cost to up to purchase the necessary systems and upgrade the equipment to allow us to return to events safely. Touchless faucets, touchless urinals, touchless toilets, all of those things are being retrofitted. Um, the list is literally a mile long. So all of that will be done, but we will also need, need to convince the public through a, uh, a public communication and relations campaign of all of those things that we've done, because it's one thing to be allowed to do it, but it's another thing to to uh, to get the public confidence for people uh, to actually attend. When I talked about hockey, we suspect it'll be a diminished capacity, probably about a thousand fans a game is what we're guessing based upon current um, Pennsylvania occupancy protocols, which currently say uh, you know facilities. I think it's five thousand to ten thousand can have fifteen percent. We've also done plot plans that allow pods of social distancing and seating, uh, multi, uh, multi uh, points of ingress and egress. I could talk all night about all of our return to play plans, um, but that will need to be done as well. Relative to basketball, right now they're looking at uh, playing basketball in a single site uh, for, we'll call it a bubble, for a number of games at some um prescribed location. It will not be eerie and all the teams will assemble there and play a part of the season. Then they will go to each respective market and play 
perhaps five or six weeks in their respective markets. That is what is being, that's not any final, I'm just sharing you with you what is being contemplated. Whether that comes to fruition, who knows, because of the fluidity of, of plans that need to change uh, to deal with COVID realities. So yes, that's the case. Uh, this would be the final year of what we'll call the G League extension. They do have a third year option in their contract. That's certainly possible as well, but I think COVID has made uh, everything that would be normal and customary, very abnormal and uh, not at all customary. So that's the status there. Um, and we certainly hope to return to play baseball in April. That's a bit of a different dynamic given that it's outdoors. Um, but even that in and of itself creates tremendous amount of challenges. Casey, thank you. That was a really amazing run through and um, really vital information for us to hear and for the citizens to hear. So really thank you a lot. You're welcome. Liz, thank you. I'll, I'll just add that um, in terms of the, you asked about the, the amusement tax and the budget, we're down about $150,000 this year in our amusement tax revenue. Um, so, so far we've collected 110,000. Paul only projected uh, for next year's budget, 100,000 as of right now. Renee, intuitively, um, without completing it, just intuitively, I think that's a, that's a great uh, a great estimate given the today's conditions. Thank you, Casey, very much. Um, was it your group then that had the summer uh, movies at the UPMC Park? Well, that was our facility, but actually, Kathy, that was a uh, program that was sponsored by the uh, Erie Seawolves just to uh, you know, try to provide some family friendly, affordable fun utilizing the facility. So although we hosted it in our facility, we were not actually the producer or presenter of the event. Uh, event. That was done by the uh, you know, Erie Seawolves with our full support. And I give them all of the credit for, uh, for uh, coming up with that idea and, uh, and executing it well. Thank you, Casey. And what did you what did you say about the border crossings? Um, will the ca Canada be able to come into the United States for the hockey games? No, right now the border is closed. Okay. Except for there's some obviously exceptions for essential workers. I don't know the exact protocols, but for all intents and purposes, if you wanted to visit Toronto tomorrow, you could not get across the border. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I didn't go to those um, movie things, but it sounded like a, lo a lot of fun for people. And I was wondering, like, maybe uh, could you do something like a, a virtual concert on the wall or something like that? That's, you know, obviously uh, been played, like, let's say um, the Stones from a certain year or uh, the Beatles from a certain year or something like that. Could you do like retro concerts? Um, you know, we could do that, but when you buy the rights, you need to secure the facility. You need to have all of the COVID, uh, the COVID precautions. And those, those are, those costs are not in de minimis. Um, right. And when you look at all of the costs to produce such a thing and realize you would have to sell tickets at some certain level with the reduced capacities, it just doesn't pencil out. It would be a, uh, a sure way to lose money. And, and we've, we've lost 7 million and we can't go any further right now. Right, but, but, I was just brainstorming, thanks. Yeah, no, no, it, it, no we've, we've looked at other things like that. And, and to be candid, I, I've looked and followed uh, driving concerts, either live concerts or, or others that have been presented in other venues around the country. Um, and uh, they have generally not been financially successful unless you can get the artist to perform for free and the sound and lighting company to do it pretty much for free. And then when it does happen, the people are supposed to be in their cars uh, watching the concert or by their cars or in their areas and they all end up right in front of the stage. So um, 
you know, and you can't have enough security there. It, it's, it, it, it's a great idea, but unfortunately it just doesn't pencil out. Right. Thank you. Thank you for responding. And thank you for the in-depth analysis you gave us. My pleasure. Any other questions from council at this time? Casey, very, very informative and uh, probably more informative than you want it to be because of this COVID, but uh, it appears you got a lot of things under control and you're working hard to uh, keep things that way. Uh, we on council appreciate the effort and the update uh, and it, Anything at all on your end that uh, may come up, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Again, thank you. You know, we've always been good, great partners. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly available at any time to update council on whatever matters. And again, uh, you know, we'll continue to send you those uh, construction reports uh, uh, on the projects. If you have any questions about those, uh, let us know. And and I can hardly wait for the day to invite all the members of council to UPMC Park to show uh, the fabulous facility as that we have. Uh, and I'm gonna close by saying that, you know, Erie, Pennsylvania has the best in class public assembly facilities of anywhere in the country. And, I, and I'm saying that um, very proudly uh, and it's because of a lot of effort by a lot of people uh, elected officials, staff, uh, the community support. But I, uh, I've been around uh, for some time now. I've been at a lot of public assembly facilities about the country. You know, it's been my career and I know what other communities have. And for a community of our size, I am absolutely certain that we are best in class for public assembly facilities in any community in America. And we all should be proud of that because we were all part of that. And I'll finally close by saying, <laughs> you know, the ballpark was, is only here because of a 4-3 vote. The convention center is only here because of a 4-3 vote. The Sheraton Hotel is only here because of a 4-3 vote. <laughs> the, 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 the Bayfront uh, Library is only here because of a 4-3 vote. So I want everyone to be part of the four moving forward, not the three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Well, everybody, that concludes our study session for this evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, and have a good night. Thank you. thank you, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. It was a good long